what I feel like. You know those clowns that have the big pants? <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> We're spending a summer with the Psalms. And uh, I, I trust that it's been profitable to you. We, because what I've, where, where I've kind of modeled this sermon series on is I never thought much of the Psalms. They didn't get them until I went to seminary and they began teaching me how to read them. And I thought everybody needs to know this. And so that's where we are. Well, we're going to turn a corner here. And for about the next oh, six weeks, we're going to take a look at the, sh- at, uh, the 23rd Psalm. Um, we have observed that Hebrew poetry uh, often takes the forms of prayers or songs and uh, have looked at that. We've seen that the way the, the Hebrew poetry is, is it works by a, a device, a literary device called parallelism. It's quite different from what we're used to in poetry of rhythm and rhyme. You know, for us, Mary had a little lamb, this fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. That's our kind of poetry. But Hebrew poetry doesn't worry so much about rhythm and rhyme as uh, different kinds of parallelism. Now, Regardless of what you, where, what form poetry may take, all poetry has an economy of language and uses uh, uh, figures of speech. It's, it speaks in word pictures. And so when you're reading the Psalms, you need to uh, take a look at these various word pictures and the way they do it. There's a lot of simile and metaphor. You know, that's com- that's implied comparisons or comparisons using like and as. God, Pastor John, I'm back to your high school English class. Yeah. Uh, it helps you read your Bible. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then there's a, a thing called, uh, a one called personification that we'll talk a little bit more about. Also, uh, the poetry uses literary devices. Now, in this, in Hebrew poetry, we use a lot uh, of devices. One of them is called chiasmus. Now, chiasmus, the the Greek letter chi is X. And so what happens is you get the first line AB, and the second line you get BA, which echoes the thing. You want to look for those things uh, as you work through the the Psalms because it will help you appreciate... um, and understand better what what's being said, but there's also framing. We've had we've had uh, several psalms that we've looked at that have started off with a certain line and they end with a certain line. That's called framing, and uh, we use that. And then of course repetition. You know, you uh, uh, especially in scripture, a threefold uh, repetition: holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's a poem in the book of Isaiah. It, that threefold holiness of God, um, the deep emphasis. And so those are, are things that we want to use. Now, I'm calling your attention to this because the reason why I want to pick up the 23rd Psalm is that this focuses in on the imagery. Um, the Psalms we've learned gives voice to our emotions. And we've learned that it speaks to our heart. Now, I want you to make a connection here. Why did we choose How Great Thou Art, What a Mighty God We Serve, Be Exalted, O God, and the 23rd Psalm for our scripture reading? They all tie together. We're praising God. You see it? And, and I'll tell you, it was wonderful when we got done with singing, What a Mighty God We Serve. This place was just alive, right? And our emotions were crazy. Okay, that's what's going on. And, and so it does give voice to our emotions. Now, what we have in Psalm 23 is an extended word picture, okay? We're going to talk about sheep, shepherds, and there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. Now, my goal 
in spending the time with this really twofold. First of all, I want to familiarize you with the pastoral images. Here's the situation. I don't know about you. Um, I was raised on concrete. Uh, those of you that were raised on farm, very few of you, uh, especially here in the Midwest, had anything to do with sheep. And so what happens here is, is uh, being raised on concrete, the only thing I think of when I think of a shepherd is in my bedroom, mom had hanging for years this ugly, ugly picture of, it was about this big, it was in an oval frame, and there was this shepherd with his crook chasing his sheep, you know, following his sheep, I don't know what it was. Uh, and that, that's the extent of my knowledge. And so uh, I want to familiarize you with the pastoral images, but more importantly, I want, as we explore these pastoral images, I'm hoping that we deepen our love for God through a deeper appreciation of his care for us. That's what this uh, poem is all about. Now, I will be using as a basis for this series Philip Keller's book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. Now, how many of you have read that book? Lucy and, uh, okay, not very many. I can tell you it is on Amazon. Uh, it starts around five bucks and goes from there. Uh, you can get it. It's also, I believe it's on Kindle if you want to do that. Uh, but it is a wonderful book and I recommend it to you. It's kind of like some of the others. It's become a bit of a Christian classic. But Keller was a shepherd. He raised sheep. And he was also a lay speaker. And so he developed this, and, uh, you know, it was talking with people, and he said, you know, you've got to put this in a book, and so that's what he did. And it has blessed generations. And so that's going to be the basis of what I, what I say. Please don't take this as being original. Uh, it's not. Uh, but I can't. I mean, one beggar tell another beggar where it got bread. How's that? Does that work? Okay. We're going to probably deal with this. Probably uh, just a verse at a time. We'll take a verse a week and look at it. What I intend to do on our scripture reading is I'm going to give you the 23rd Psalm in various translations. And so you're going to get a feel for some of the different translations that come around and, and, and how uh, that is. But we're going to look at this at one verse at a time. Verse 1 is, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. First thing about the 23rd Psalm, it's progressive parallelism. Okay? Now, okay, go back into your lane thing. What do we mean by that? It means that while we're taking these lines and we are echoing them, we're actually adding to the images. We're not echoing them as uh, much of what we saw in the things that we were looking at before where we would echo the lines. These move forward. So but what we're going to do, we're going to take an image, and then we're going to add to it, we're going to keep adding to it, we're going to keep adding to it through the, throughout the whole, whole song. This is what's going to happen. The next thing you need to talk about is this is a sheep bragging about his shepherd. Okay? Uh, here's a very important part in understanding not only the psalms, but Proverbs, much of the prophets that are written in poetry or written around throughout Scripture, you've got to know who is speaking to properly interpret. Let me give you an example. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 26, we read this. But since you rejected me when I call and gave no heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I will turn and laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. Wow. Now, I have heard uh, different people say, well, if you don't live for God and if you don't obey his rules and calamity happens, God's going to mock you. I just stop right there. Does that sound like the God we serve? 
doesn't mock me. My God died on a cross to save me from my stupidity. Right? Okay? It's absolutely inconsistent with what God is. But people not paying attention, because it's in the Bible, it's got to be God talking. Well, it's poetry. And we read in uh, here, uh, but Proverbs 120 that starts this section reads, Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public square. And then we get Dame Wisdom's soliloquy. Now, you and I have all done some dumb things, and wisdom has mocked us. A couple weeks ago, I was, our, uh, we, we got, had a sink in the bathroom that wasn't vented properly. And we've lived with it for four years, and since I've been messing with, with uh, plumbing, I decided to fix it. Now, the pipes run in a, in a cabinet underneath and back of uh, the bathroom sink there. And they're real close. We got, the, we got the drain is here, but the water, copper water lines are right above it. And there isn't a lot of space. Well, the one area that I want in is okay, so I grabbed my handy-dandy Sawzall. But looking at that, I knew that it was close. And so I went out and I bought me a little saw so that I could cut in tight places. Well, I made the first cut with the Sawzall. <laughs> Got the thing cut loose. I was fine. Took the second one, I thought, nah. I can do this. And so I got my saws all. <laughs> Didn't quite get it through. So I put it in the little fire. And I, <laughs> okay, it breaks. Bingo. Pow. I hit that uh, pot copper line. And uh, even though I let off the trigger, I cut a hole in that, pot, well, that hot water line. And I had water all over the bathroom, all over the basement. And I looked at myself and I said, you idiot. I even had the saw. I knew better. And wisdom says, you idiot. But God said, here, let me help you mop it up and find a way to fix it. Amen? Okay. Now, when we begin thinking about that, we need to remember that the, psalm, the 23rd Psalm is a psalm of praise. And as a psalm of praise, it really does not fit neatly into our orientation, uh, disorientation, reorientation model. Because uh, as a, a psalm of praise, you know, if we remember, we were talking about psalms of creation and whatever. Well, the world was the way it was supposed to be. It was working the way it was. It was good. Well, you read, this, you read it, and it's clear that there's been some uh, valley of the shadow of death, and there's been some tough times and whatever. On the other hand, it do, the praise doesn't arise like a psalm of reorientation does from a, a recent deliverance or, or whatever. It is kind of out there in a little bit of no man's lands. What it is is a praise that is a reflection on a long-term relationship. This isn't somebody that's never been around the block. This psalm is a psalm that was written by a psalmist who had spent time with God. He'd been through the tough times, and God had taken care of him. And so, when we begin to look at this psalm, we need to understand that this is a song of praise. I love this. Again, the word picture. The word picture is a sheep boasting about his shepherd. Okay? And I want you to think about that in our own lives. And I want 
much to think about our relationship with God and the praise that He is due. And for us to boast about who our shepherd is. I want to know something here because I, I do believe this is important. The name of the shepherd that is used. There's three, three words in the Old Testament that we use for God. You will find them translated uh, with certain things. In fact, if you pay attention to the, to the introductions to your Bible, you will find that uh, font and typeface are different for each one of these words, even though they are often translated Lord or Lord God uh, and different things. Uh, you will do that. But the first one is Elohim. This is the earliest name we have of God. Elohim. It is simply God. It's not just God. Furthermore, the next term is Adonai. Adonai is Lord. And when you read Lord in the scripture more often than not, uh, it is Adonai. But it is Yahweh. This is the name that when Moses was at the burning bush, and he said, how can I go? I don't even know your name. What is your name? And God from the burning bush gave his name. He said, my name is I am. I am that I am. Okay? Now I want you to, you know, we talk about, and you, you try and get a lot of things. And the Muslims, you know, try and talk about, well, we serve the same God as Abraham, and there's things in place where the Muslims are. But what name do the do the Muslims use for God? What? Allah. Allah Akbar. That's what they use when they start killing people. God be praised. <clears throat> Allah! What's that name mean? It means the God. The God! As opposed to I am. Huge difference. One is personal and one is a time. Something to be said about a name. And the name that a psalmist used is that endearing name. In fact, that name Yahweh is so precious to the Jews that they will not use, they will not vocalize that name. The truth is, we, we do not know exactly how to say that name because it was so precious to them that uh, during the... Uh, uh, during the Babylonian captivity, that became a precious name, and they would vocalize it. When they were reading the scripture out, they would simply substitute the name Adonai. And it's that, it's that way today. If those of you who may get uh, newsletters from Jews for Jesus or stuff like that, they will, they, you'll see in parentheses little words saying uh, the Lord. They don't, they don't talk about those. But it's a very precious name. The thing we need to realize is that the lot in life of any sheep depends upon the character, the ability, and the uh, diligence of their shepherd. In his book, Phil Keller talks about how that some owners are gentle, they're kind, they're intelligent, they're brave, and they're selfless in their devotion to the flock. And what happens is, is when it starts talking about that the shepherd lays down his life for the flock, that's really what happens. I mean, uh, they're in the fields, they are there, they're protecting, they're providing. They're working their land. They're doing everything they can to make sure that that sheep 
that their flock is safe, healthy, well cared for. <laughs> On the other hand, there are other managers who simply don't care. What are they? A bunch of dumb animals. And so Keller describes uh, a sheep manager who had uh, a farm right next to him, not right next to him. He was a tenant farmer. He didn't give two hoots and a holler about the flock. Now, Keller spent a lot of time uh, taking his land and seeding it, fertilizing it, making sure that it his, his sheep had the best and the most grass and to make sure that they had the cleanest and the best water. And, and he was uh, always watching over their health to make sure that they were free from parasites and disease. And, and he, was, he did things to make sure that they were protected from predators. But this guy didn't care. And on, their side of the, on that side of the fence, those sheep were scrawny and scrawny. <coughs> The only thing they had to eat was to just try and get something from the brown grass that was there on that farm. They drank water from muddy potholes, and they uh, uh, oftentimes those potholes would they'd get parasites on the inside of them. During the summer, when during fly season, flies would come up their nose and and infect them with nasal. Uh, larvae and stuff like that. And the sheep was miserable. And he thought about that. And his comment in the book was, that guy should never have even been allowed to be around the sheep. Now I want you to think about something. I don't know about you, but there are times I am overwhelmed with the way my shepherd takes care of me. Okay? We, what, he is so good. He provides for me. He cares for me. He takes care of me physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I got so I can't when I when I sit down to ask the blessing over my food, I look at that and I eat the best food available in the world. And so do you. That night we sat down to bratwurst and uh, I, I did them on the grill and I made some got some skewers and I put some vegetables on the skewer and we grilled those and put some potatoes on the pan and okay, it's 20 minutes till 12. You'll get your dinner soon. <laughs> I sat down and I thank God for that and I was eating it and I said, you know something, Lucy, I'm not sure you can get food this good in a restaurant. My Lord, just no, it's the same way. He provides for me. Now, uh, I, just where is it? Spiritually. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm just like you. I have my ups, I have my downs. But my Lord provides for me. I want you to think about the other master in this world. I, I don't know. I, I just want to cry. The funeral I had yesterday, very, very difficult to preach. Here's a young man. When I asked his family to describe him to me, first thing I said, oh, he loved to party. Party all the time. And that's what the devil does. He makes it glitter. Oh, wow, why don't you just go out and party and have a great time and 
And uh, it, it just appears so appealing. And I mean, you can go out and you can be happy and you can feel good. I mean, you take this beer and you're going to feel so good. And you take a second one and you're going to feel even better. And you smoke this joint and you're going to be uh, wonderful. And you take this LSD and you'll be out of your mind. You will experience life. And you may feel good for a while. But the consequences of one night of partying often ends up with a lifetime of consequences. Remember mom teaching me when we were growing up talking about the devil and said, John, he makes it glitter and he makes it look so good, but it's all a lie. And so yesterday, I got to bury a young man who had literally had a lifetime of trouble and ended up taking one too many pills. How's that for a master? You want to serve that master? I don't. He's cruel. He's mean. Frankly, he doesn't care about you. One of the problems that we have with, with the devil is that we see him as kind of a... Uh, you know, just a, an object down here. We don't think about him. But what you need to do is think about the devil for just a little bit and understand that he absolutely hates you. He finds joy in hurting you. His goal is to make you as miserable as he can and then destroy you and laugh about it. Oh, yeah. Let's go out and get drunk. All them church people, they don't, they don't know what fun is. I beg to differ. Amen. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I get done with a night of partying with you people, which is usually about 8 o'clock. <laughs> Ten at the latest. <laughs> John says, that's the latest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. Amen. I have no regrets. <clears throat> I have nothing to hide. That's the other master. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that the sheep says, the Lord is my shepherd, Yahweh. I am that I am. That personal relationship, he knows my name. Satan doesn't even care. <laughs> the Lord's my shepherd. Sometimes, because we've been Christians so long, sometimes we forget what we got. Sometimes. And the picture that this psalmist, this shepherd is driving, is a sheep just bragging on his shepherd. He goes on and he says, I shall not want I want you to notice that the provision on this is open-ended. He doesn't say, I, I won't want for food, or I won't want for housing, or I won't want this. Or no, he just simply says, I shall not want. Now, uh, we know that there is abundant care and provision for the necessities of life because he goes on in the next verse and says uh, that uh, he provides... Uh, 
know, he makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. We know there's the, the provision for the necessities of life. But even in the lives of well cared for sheep, you got some dark valleys. I mean, he's going to come. Up, he's going to come up here in a little bit and say, even though I walked through the valley of death, I'll fear no evil. This is not uh, a sheltered life where everything is wonderful. And everything just goes the way we want. This is a life that is a real life. And it has its trials and its tribulations and its difficulties and its defeats. It has them. It's part of life. And we have to understand that this good shepherd doesn't um, somehow make our life a bed of roses. Our shepherd, in his management of us, allows those times to make us better, stronger Christians. Amen. I won't want. Well, you know, if you serve God, you may have times of persecution. You know, I won't want. Why? Well, he's going to take care of me. What do you mean? How can a God that loves you allow them to uh, kill you? Well, <laughs> if they kill me, I go see him. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a bad deal at all to me. Well, you might get sick. No, I will get sick. You could suffer a lot of pain. I could. I might. But my, but my shepherd will give me grace and strength through all of that. I want you to notice that what happens with the with the sheep that's spent some time with the Lord, just been around the block more than once. Often as a pastor, I have to try and work with people, and frankly, it's difficult to work with them. There's people who have had something bad happen and say, well, I don't want anything to do with God. How could God allow this to happen to me? How could that be a loving God? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's not a question of if tragedies want to come into your life. It's only a matter of what and when. We all have it. Okay? For some of us, it's death in the family. For some of us, it's a loss of a job. For some of us, it's, it's, it's loss and conflict. And, and you name it. They happen. But I can tell you, to those sheep who have spent time with the shepherd, they're not afraid. They're experienced soldiers. They've been in battle before. They know what it's like, and they know whatever comes, they're going to be taken care of. You see... This is a statement of faith that expresses confidence in the shepherd's care regardless of the circumstances. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, what if? What if? I will want. Now, uh, Lucy and I were out Friday night with Paul and Marie Kirkpatrick and we were sharing back and forth. Uh, every pastor has it. And he was talking about his time in Big Rapids where they were making $50, $55, 60 a week. And that's what they were living on. And I, I told him, you know, when I went into the ministry, uh, we made $1,000 a month. This was 1988. This was not 1952. This was 1988. Made $1,000 a month. That was it. No insurance, uh, no retirement, no parsonage. We had to we had to supply our own housing and everything else. I got three kids and a wife, and a thousand dollars a month. What happened? I got a great shepherd. How'd you live? Sometimes I don't know. It just happened. He just provided. 
There were other times he did wonderful things for us. There were circumstances and situations that he worked. And all I can tell you is, is one of the things that young preachers have to learn is, is to rely on God and don't worry about the money, don't worry about the provision. You're working for the best provider there is. You may not have everything that you would like, but I guarantee you, you'll eat everything, you'll have everything you need to eat, and frankly, you'll find out it's pretty good, too. What this is, will land, is a statement of contempt. Paul said, godliness with contentment is great game. The problem with too many Christians is that they're not content with what they have. Got to have to do this. Got to have that. Got to have this. Reminds me of a story. You heard me tell it. About the man and woman that got married. He wanted to get rich and she just wanted to be comfortable. He got rich and she ain't comfortable yet. <laughs> Please laugh. <laughs> Thank you. I need that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the way some of us Christians are. We're just not content. <clears throat> and so I leave you this morning with the idea that the Lord is our shepherd. We won't want. And there is no need for anxiety because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not be in need. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us listen. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, we've done our best to just kind of think about you, your provision. It's hard to say much more than thank you because words fail us for what you've done. Lord, you know we're living in a world that wants to create fear. Father, we've got so much advertising that wants us to live in a constant state of want. Lord, help us to be content with what we have. More than that, let us to be content with you. Thank you for all your Amen. Let us stand. Turn to him number one.